Studying how folks survived harsh winters in the 18th century is fascinating. Journals, seeing ledgers, seeing how people were preparing for the winter, and thinking about things like, the only food you're gonna eat is the food that you grow. There's nothing else that you can count on. It's easy for us to romanticize what it would be like to live 250 or 300 years ago. Us, as we're researching for videos and we're reading books, you guys in the comments section, and oftentimes we'll even see this term called simpler times, or we'll say that, there really wasn't anything simple about it. It was pretty darn terrifying if you think about it. It's the middle of winter. It's freezing. There's snowstorms. Up north there are snow drifts because there's nothing to stop the wind from blowing across. And you are kind of holed up in your house or your cabin by yourself or with your family and all you have is what you were able to store back for the winter. This is not a situation where there are grocery stores close by. This is not a situation where there are neighbors close by that you can go to and ask for food if you need it. This is isolation. It's nothing new. They knew what they were getting into. But not only are you getting to an area where you're building house and you're starting to prepare your property and get everything situated, winter's still coming. So while you're doing all of that work, you're still putting things in the ground and planning everything so that you're gonna have food stores come winter time. One of the main things that people are going to be storing back for winter are root vegetables. Now they're gonna be salting meat, they're gonna be drying grains, there's going to be other things to eat. But when it comes down to the day to day, what can we store back at high volume to get through this winter, it's root vegetables. And in the onion video that we did not too long ago is said, the onion was the king for a savory flavor. And for the potato, it is the king to fill the belly. If you go searching for poor people food in the time period, you're gonna find potato, potato, potato. If you're gonna look for food that can be a substitute for something, to make something cheaper and still be filling, you're gonna find potatoes. If you're looking for anything that can be added to something to fill it up, it is potato. No matter what, if it's an apple pie, you will find apple pies with potatoes. We've done them on the channel. If it is, I need to substitute flour, you're going to make potato bread. If you're looking to spread anything, it's potatoes. In fact, Primitive Cookery was a cookbook that was put out in the time period, and it was a way of making cheap meals. In the back of that book, there are several for the dirt cheap, and so many of them use potatoes because they're plentiful, they're easy to grow, and they don't really cost a lot. On top of a potato being a cheap and sustainable way to feed your family and yourself, it is a fantastic way to feed your livestock. During my research, I found this little bit of reading. This is, after all, the chief object of modern husbandry. For if a man can rely upon this potato for the winter consumption of his yard and fattening or keeping hogs and feeding his horses and fattening his bullocks, he has made one of the greatest acquisitions that can be desired, since he can do all of this upon land much too stiff and wet for turnips. This was a staple for the homestead. This kept the homestead going through winter. Not only is the potato keeping the homestead or the farm functioning during the winter time, but it is actually keeping the city going as well because this is poor people food. If you look through cookbooks of the time period, potato is the number one thing that people are going to when they're poor and they can't afford nicer ingredients because you can take a potato and it's basically just this starchy mush if you boil it and you can flavor that however you want to. So you're seeing everything from mock apple pies to mock cheesecakes. Uh, they're just having a dish of butter and potato, which we would call mashed potatoes now, but that was just, that was dinner. It was, here's a potato, here's some butter, mush it together, and there you go. One of the things that you see at the poor house or even from street vendors that is very affordable and easy to come by is potato soup. There are so many recipes for potato soup in this time period, but they are all in the context of poor food. I have not found a single one that wasn't a meager soup. Here's a reading from a country housewife's family companion by William Ellis. It says several of our prudent housewives foresee the great conveniency of having broad beans, peas, carrots, turnips, potatoes, cabbages, onions, parsley, and other kitchenware ready for use against one of them in harvest time. 
So they're planning ahead. They're already thinking, okay, we're gonna have all these harvesters in here. We need to feed them. We're gonna store these things back. And then what's not used, that just goes right into winter storage. So when I first had the idea to do this winter survival food series, I knew, okay, I knew I wanted to do something with onion and that was easy, so I did that first. And then potato was kind of like the pinnacle, but I didn't know which direction to go with it because you can go so many different ways. So I started on potato bread. We've had a really popular video with potato bread in the past, so I decided not to do that. And I wanted to think about, okay, what is the easiest way that people can incorporate potatoes into their diet, but it's not just a potato, like a baked potato or something like that. Potato soup is it. And as you keep going and looking for potatoes with poor people, because let's face it, if you're rural in the time period, you're not necessarily poor, but the idea of winter survival food, we're talking about people that don't just have the pick of everything. They have to deal with what they have. That's what I wanna focus on. And potato soup is something that you see over and over and over again. This recipe in particular has been rehashed in so many different books for different quantities of soup that they want in the end result and used in different people's dialects or in their own words, but it's the same recipe and they're just copying it and they're just copying it for their own personal use and for their own soup kitchen or their own just cause when they're trying to feed the poor people. Let's talk about it. Let's dig into this recipe for potato soup just a little bit. It's, like I said, it's rehashed a lot. There are different versions. Some people give a lot of explanation as to why you're using these ingredients. For some people, it's short and sweet and they're just like, just do it. It's cheap and people will like it. Potato soup. Stew five pounds, coarsest parts of beef or mutton and 10 quarts of water till half done. Add a quantity of potatoes, skinned, and some onions, pepper, and salt. Stir frequently and boil enough. Bones of beef added would increase the soup in richness or quantity. Now what's interesting about this is that they've broken it down so that you know how much it's going to cost. And they've estimated the cost at 50 cents for the entire pot of soup. And it says it gives 10 quarts of soup, meat and potatoes, and dines 10 men for just five cents. So there it is, it is that simple. Beef broth with potatoes, onions, and seasoning. They go on to explain why this is such a great solution to the problem of poor food. All these people need to eat, but they don't have time to make bread and they don't have time to be in the kitchen all day. You put all this into a pot, let it boil, and it's good to go. We're gonna cut this recipe in half. We don't need a potato soup that is 10 quarts. The first thing that you need to do is get five quarts of water on the stove, start it boiling. You're gonna take two and a half pounds of meat and you're gonna cut it up. Now, if you can't find something that's coarse and you can't find something that's got bones in it, that's fine. Just take some beef and cut it up and put it in the water to start cooking. In the meantime, you're gonna be paring these potatoes. Now, it calls for 11 to 12 pounds of potatoes if you cut this in half. So that's a lot of potatoes. Give yourself some time to get the pairing done. After they're paired, slice and put them in the water to start boiling with a couple of onions and some salt and pepper. All right, so this is an interesting point I'm gonna to try to make here and it's a stretch, so come along with me. In the Christmas Carol, Scrooge gets a bowl of something to eat. Now Dickens leaves us some evidence of what might be here and in popular culture, you will see mainly the idea that he is eating gruel because the point that Dickens is trying to make is that Scrooge is so cheap, such a miser, that he will not even spring for a good meal. Now, I know that popular culture says gruel. I've even seen some people say it's split pea soup, but Scrooge says in the context of the story that he has eaten something bad, and that is why he's seeing spirits. And he gives us two hints. And the list of foods that it could be was potato and beef. And I think, and John thinks as well, that he was eating potato soup. It's finished. Here's our potato soup. As you can see, it looks a lot different than what we would come to expect as a potato soup now. It's not a loaded baked potato soup with cheese and sour cream and all sorts of chives and that kind of thing. But it is the most common potato soup that you would find in the period. Most everything started with some beef broth. This has potatoes that are just starting to break down. From the reading, it looks like maybe they intend for potatoes to really break down. You can just cook it longer. 
if you'd like that to happen. But I wanted to have some chunks of potatoes left in it and we're gonna give it a try. I'm expecting the beef to really be the flavor that comes forward. The onions are gonna come and give a little sweet, savory thing. And the potatoes, I think they're just gonna be a nice mouthfeel and filler. Let's see what's going on. That is really, really good. It's like when your pot roast and your pot roast potatoes kind of come together on your plate. It's fantastic, you'll love it.